Welcome to my talk about reproducible builds and especially the unexpected benefits and problems uh, you have with these. Um, but first, introduction of uh, me, who is that guy talking to you. I'm Bernard Wielmann, working for the company SUSE. We are doing Linux distributions for quite a while, nearly 30 years, you know. So, uh, and also some other stuff. But I'm uh, involved with reproducible builds since six years, and since then I did over 1,000 uh, reproducibility patches to help uh, with that project, and also contributed upstream with the project. But why does it even matter? Yeah, this is problem that our machines understand only machine code. That's binary files. And it's really hard to review these binary files. It's not impossible, but not exactly easy. So most of the time in the open source world, we review sources of these binaries. But then there comes the additional trouble that we must ensure that these sources are really what produce the binaries that the users actually use. And that is where reproduce builds come in. So what is it? Uh, on the basic, very simple level, we build the sources twice and check that indeed you get the same result twice. That's a basic requirement. And uh, after that there's some more to do, but when you can do that, then you have sources that can be built reproducibly. And when I tell people first about this concept, there's two different directions. One is, yeah, sure, computers are deterministic, so it should be very trivial uh, what's there to do even. And the other direction is, oh, we have such a complex program with uh, a thousand dependencies and all that stuff going in the end, it can't possibly uh, get reproducible, can it? But the truth is, is so often uh, somewhere in the middle. So. so, what are the problems with reproducible bits? Why would the binary vary? If you have worked with reproducible bits a bit, then uh, you will have encountered timestamps, because a lot of people want to know when was it built, or maybe they don't actually want to know when, it, when was it built, but they want to know what version is it, and that's very easy if you have a timestamp, then you know, ah, that's the version I compiled yesterday. But of course, if you compile a new version, it will have a new timestamp, and binaries will vary. Host names, same uh, thing, also happens. Then, yeah, file systems, like the X4 file system, with the uh, dear index feature, and the dear index feature uses some random hashing with a random seed. And that means if you do a list of files in a directory, then they will have random order, and that comes through the fine program, through Python globs, and C read their functions. And so all of these functions will deliver random order then, and that can influence the outputs that happens. Then you have c can have race conditions. That is, uh, if you use make-j, that's very easy. You create a file, then another process comes around and uh, recreates a file in a different way, and depending on who is faster, it sometimes uh, results in one version or the other uh, in the output. Oh, different variants of that. And you can have even compiled time CPU detection. That is very common in the scientific community. People say, yeah, we have these scalar vector AVX2 instructions, and of course we want to use them, so they compile with uh, minus m uh, native, m arch minus m arch native, and that means the compiler will check uh, what the build system uh, has for CPU and use all the features available, but then if you build it elsewhere with a different set of CPU features, bad luck, a different binary can't reproduce. So that's also not uncommon, and uh, this one can even lead to bugs 
When you have a build farm with different machines, sometimes you get binaries that users can run older machines, and sometimes when you build on new machines, you get uh, instructions that are not supported on older machines, and that you will get uh, ZIG -il, illegal instruction, and then the program will terminate on these older machines. So, not good. We patch that out. Try to use always the same instructions. Uh, it's fine to even always use AVX, but then uh, at least you will know that it will uh, work every time the same. So, but then we also have surprising problems. Things uh, nobody really expected. That's it when, is when this talk gets interesting. Because uh, sometimes uh, there are packages that you can't really easily make reproducible because uh, it varies because of uh, profile guided optimization. So, what is that? And that is uh, when you want to squeeze out the last bits of performance. And to do that, you uh, build your program once with uh, profiling options enabled that add some extra code into the binaries. Then you run your profiling run uh, that will produce some output in GC in DA files uh, containing some counters which branches were taken and how often. And after that, you compile your program a second time using uh, that extra output and uh, that helps the optimizer to put the right branches into the fast pass and the action exceptions will be put into the slow pass. But of course uh, if your profiling run varies even for uh, even for a very very bit if it varies even for a tiny bit then the optimizer will produce different output and that means uh, not reproducible. So you need to make sure that it's really the same and it can be really sensitive. I remember when I looked into the gzip package, um, I gave it the same tarball and it still uh, produced variations because the same tarball was under slash temp, under a random uh, mktemp uh, file name and then we still got variations because there was a two lower function uh, in gzip and the two lower function sometimes saw more uppercase characters and sometimes uh, less uppercase characters and that meant GCC produced different optimizations and I really had to give it that tarball over standard in and then it couldn't see the random file name anymore and then it became reproducible and that is really how sensitive it is. So, and then we have other packages like uh, GCC and Python, and they have really a large comprehensive profiling run. For example, GCC as a profiling run builds all of GCC. So it has really exercised all of the different code passes. Uh, yeah, but it's very hard to make that reproducible. So at the moment, uh, GCC is only reproducible if you disable profiling. That's the easy way out. Uh, uh, you lose like 8% performance then, but you have reproducible, reproducible results. That's a trade-off you have there. And the other uh, trade-off there sometimes is with security. It's also a bit surprising because uh, we do reproducible builds uh, to get better security. But there was, for example, the libcamera package, and libcamera uses a random, GC, uh, random GPG key created during compile time. And that key is then used to sign modules, so later at runtime it can see which modules uh, were really compiled as part of the main build and uh, it gives them uh, extra permissions because it knows uh, it can trust them. 
And uh, if someone tries to sneak in extra modules later, it will see, oh no, they are not signed by the uh, or random uh, private key. So, uh, what solutions exist uh, to that problem? Yeah, um, could add the private key uh, to the sources and declare part of the sources, and then we could use the same private key and make reproducible signatures. But that somehow defeats the purpose of uh, signatures, because then everyone can use the private key to sign the extra modules as well. Not good. Mm, or um, there's this other package called Shim. That's a very small bootloader and we build it once and then we give it to a third party and let them sign it. And then we put the signatures at, uh, as part of the sources and because uh, the binaries are reproducible, we can gen we can then at the end of the build just uh, add the signatures next to it, and uh, it will match because it's still the same binary. And that works uh, for the shim package uh, because uh, we change it very rarely. Uh, but on the other hand, it uh, defeats the purpose of open source because then you can't just uh, change the sources and add small patches to fix issues. So also not that nice. That's possible trade-offs you have there, or we say, yeah, it's not reproducible, sorry. And uh, just ship unreproducible binaries uh, with signatures. Maybe it's even possible to have a special program that strips off the signatures and then you can prove it's still the same binaries after the stripping. So, next up, let's look at uh, what surprising benefits we have. So, when you have reproducible builds, you can build a binary twice and get the same binaries. Then you can also use diverse double compilation as uh, a counter to the trusting trust attack. So what's a trusting trust attack even? That's uh, when you have a compiler and uh, there's a backdoor in the compiler. And that backdoor means that when you compile the compiler again uh, from source, it will re-add the backdoor into it and it's hard to get out the backdoor. You even see it because the backdoor is not in the source, but it's in the compiler you used to build the source. And when you use diverse double compilation, you can use two, three, four compilers and all build uh, the same target compiler and then use that target compiler to build again the target compiler. And it should lead to identical results because uh, the intermediate compiler should be functionally identical. And we even have done that three years ago in a small project called DDC POC as a proof of concept for a diverse double compilation. And we used uh, the tiny CC because that compiles really in 20 seconds. And that's fast, easy, and it's self contained. It's not perfect, but it shows it's possible there. Yeah, another benefit is that it can reduce load on the build service because in the build service uh, we track dependencies so if you have a change in component A some library and uh, maybe it was not a big change uh, we just changed a readme uh, comment in a source code or something um, then it doesn't know uh, that it doesn't affect other things so it tries to rebuild other things but it will see that these other things uh, that dependent on the library didn't actually change so it doesn't need to republish uh, them doesn't need to waste bandwidth pu pushing to the mirrors and uh, users don't need to pull a new version from the mirrors so it saves a lot of load on all these components that's nice and when you have reproducible builds, you can even find uh, bugs that uh, corrupt data at compile time. And uh, there's a few listed here on our OpenSUSE bugzilla, bugzilla OpenSUSE org. And one was even a collection of bugs 
on the mailing lists that uh, I shared there. So, and the fun one uh, was the bash one, where I found uh, that the documentation uh, had a wrong string that should read bash, uh, but it actually said uh, bhh, and that turned out to come from a strict copy uh, from overlapping regions where the documentation documentation says no, you shouldn't uh, use string copy from overlapping regions, and there was even a commie. Uh, and comment, and the comment said, yeah, we should use memo, so that was a patch even. So this kind of bugs you can find and fix. And then there's even more things uh, you can uh, benefit from, and we collected that some years ago on that page the buy-in page on the reproducible its project. So if you're interested, you can look in there. And next up, we want to look at how to debug. And for that, I've written a whole document called how to debug. That's a bit specific to OpenSUSE, but the general Steps are the same, uh, depending uh, independent on uh, which distribution or which set of tools you use. So first you set up the tools and you use them to check is there even an issue. And if there's an issue, then you go in and debug to find the source of the issue. And once you found the source, then you go and fix your issue and in the end you submit your issues. and when we look closely at the file, then uh, I wrote a tool to do a rebuild with KVM, and that can have a custom level of variations. It can vary the file system read the order, or it cannot. It can build on the same day, or it can build 16 years apart. And like these things, or with address space layout randomization. And there's another tool called Nachbau, uh, which is doing a replication build, so it takes the official binary build and tries to reproduce it as closely as possible. And it should produce similar binaries, except our official binaries don't uh, normalize the m times uh, currently, so we don't get bit reproducible binaries so far but close, and once you know there is an issue, then you go and debug the issue, and for that I have a tool called Autoclassify, and that will build binaries uh, with the least amount of variations, and uh, when that hum how, uh, becomes reproducible, then it will uh, change bits to zero and more bits to zero, and at some point it will reach a point where it becomes unreproducible again, and then it will let the one bit stand in there and uh, turn the other bits to zero, and in the end you see, oh, that's bit number seven, that's uh, parallelism maybe. And then you look for issues with parallelism and how that can influence the result. And a tool that comes in handy there is called Auto Provenance, that uses a trace output where you build your program under S trace and it will see what files uh, get written by which program and what forks happened. And that uh, sort of gives you a call trace. So you see, okay, this is make minus J called uh, this program and then that and then it called GCC again to produce the output file again and then you can see, okay, that's a race condition there and fix that. And there's a lot of other ways to find provenance that, for example, after build I create a diff of the build root, and in that diff you can look for C files and H files that differs, or even configure output and make files that created were created as part of the build. And uh, once you see uh, these differences, it can get really straightforward to find the root cause of the issues. Sometimes you can just look at the build log, yeah, especially if you have verbose options enabled. You do that. 
and uh, see okay this one build uh, did that step and the other did not and then you go in and check why was this difference there or sometimes it's a ordering issue and you can see these things in the build look uh, if you look the right way or maybe uh, you see in the output there's a string and it uh, has a date in there and next to the date there's uh, this file was auto generated at and then you grab the sources for this or you just grab for a percent y or year uh, because the output has a year in there or other typical strings uh, that appear like yeah python clock function or the walk or list functions that's very common so depending on uh, the type of issue you see you can look for different things there and can uh, even do manually s trace and of course it produces a lot of output and it's not exactly easy to read so if the other tools work that's a uh, <laughs> fallback so and once you found the issue you go to fixing the issue and that can be really simple like with state issues we have um, the thing called uh, source state epoch so you can uh, patch the code to use that one or even better you just omit uh, the date just depends on how good you are con in convincing the upstream to do that so that would be dropping the unreproducible elements you can drop the host name of the build machine drop the user that built it some projects even capture the uh, what was the build cpu and it shouldn't matter ideally so if you can drop it that uh, is sometimes a very good uh, approach because it reduces the complexity of upstream. Mm. You can normalize like with source state epoch or you sort lists that were unreproducible. Also from hashes, sometimes you have hashes with random order and you sort them when they are used. Or you have these actual bugs like uninitialized memory, you just analyze initialize your uninitialized memory so in the end you have a patch so what do you do with the patch if there's an upstream and it's active then you get it upstream and uh, that works even in like 50 percent of cases sometimes there's no active upstream then you have to fork it carry the patch downstream in your distribution packages and maybe there's other issues upstream disagrees uh, on the solution so then you have to go back and maybe na make a nicer patch and all this cost more uh, what's the solution and so at some point you have a patch in submit the patch there's different ways with git github gitlab they're all different some projects even use arc there's more to do. Mercurial, that's very rare, but used in a few places and some projects have mailing lists or even just individual orders. That's very common in the scientific community and then you just send uh, the patch to the main author and if he doesn't react, maybe you find uh, other people who know how to get patches in there and uh, git log is really useful in there to tell you who to uh, contact and finally uh, what good is it uh, to patch if you can't tell people about that so you add it to the uh, reproducible builds reports and people can look at the patches and uh, maybe even improve them or comment on it and you get your small bit of fame there and sometimes it takes longer for patches to get merged so it's really useful to have a list of them so you can revisit them later and see if it's uh, if there's still something to do for you to make changes at signed off by and uh, these things that are missing and contribute to license agreements so and sometimes they don't react so you ping them again later uh, because things can fall through cracks and 
people don't always have time so it's good to remind them once or twice later but sometimes uh, it's just not the right uh, path to reach people so we try different ways and, and email or use IRC and find other contacts and somehow there will be a way to get your patches in so that it it's for patches and mostly for the main part of the talk and then would be the end of the video and opening to questions and answers so what are your questions and thanks for listening so far
the platform, or if you are online on the virtual platform, feel free to submit your questions there. Um, it is via text only.